And in keeping with my new commitment to observe strict racial quotas on this program, uh, today I am going to be uh, speaking with a white female who uh, goes by the name of Ann Coulter. Um, because it's uh, you know I have to I have to stay on top of these things and so you you made it just by the by the color of your skin today how are you oh whew. I was I was waiting to get ahead on the color of my skin yeah well good luck with that hey <laughs> um, you know I'm living in the middle of this nightmare of the uh, shooting at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and uh, and and I've had a tough time you know emotionally I knew people and all the rest of it. But I tell you, I am so in line with your article today about that dear colleague letter that President Obama did, which I believe is at the root, at the heart of what we saw transpire here. Yes, it clearly, um, the dear colleague letter, I should say, this is something I had been thinking about writing about for a while, but boy, did this give me my, my opening. Mm-hmm. Um, this was Obama's Department of Justice, or sorry, both Justice, but mostly Department of Education, taken over by, um, you know, ed school lunatics. Um, the basic thesis <laughs> that they believe is that all races must, must commit crimes, expellable offenses, suspendable offenses. Um, all races commit them at the exact same level, same frequency, same intensity. And so if suspensions and expulsions in public schools are not, you do not have the exact same percentage for black students as for Asian students as for white students, well, ipso facto, we have proof of racism. Um, based on this theory, and, and this is what you, I mean, if you run on a Google search, your, your computer will explode if you put in the school-to-prison pipeline um, um, because of this racism with differential rates of suspensions and expulsions. Um, 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 the blacks and browns get records when they're in school for being expelled and often arrest records, and that makes it hard for them to, um, you know, go to MIT and design spaceships. So if you just don't keep a record of their criminality. Um, they'll be able to go to MIT. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, th- this was imposed on schools throughout the nation. What was interesting was um, Broward County. The model. The school shooting was they didn't have to be asked. No, they leapt ahead. They were actually a model mm-hmm. for, for Obama's Department of Justice, I found in their notations. Um, Broward County Agreement, model for rest of the country, or whatever the quote is that's in my column, but it's roughly that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what the agreement was, which I wrote about last week, um, among the sheriff, the famous this freak, Scott mm-hmm. Israel, um, along with the, the superintendent of schools, Robert Runsey, um, and various you know local NAACP, a judge, the um, defense lawyers, juvenile justice, they all agreed um, essentially not to, dis- to discipline brown and black students, or bodies as they call them, um, black and brown bodies, um, to make sure they could, they could get good jobs and get into Ivy League schools. Just don't notice. If no one notices their criminality, it's like it never happened. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we, they created a paper trail. Uh, and, and, you know, what, how do you think they would treat a lad named Nicholas Cruz, whatever his ethnicity actually was? He had an Hispanic name, and, and we know there's a paper trail of his being reported um, by students. Um, one of the most um, detailed and shocking descriptions was in BuzzFeed. Three students sent in their, the text messages they were receiving from Nicholas Cruz, um, some of which one kid was really funny in his responses. He'd get all these just crazed death threat after death threat after death threat, and he'd send these funny little memes back um, with like a dancing bear or something to, to Nicholas Cruz trying to calm him down. He was actually pretty funny. Um, but look, threatening, as you know, threatening to kill someone in Florida, I believe, in all states, that itself is a felony. And they took these text messages to to the school safety officer. They took the text messages to the head of 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 the the high school ROTC program. Nothing was done. Nothing was done. And by the way, you're down in Florida. Um, you know a lot of reporters. You've got to get some reporters to to get the school records on Nicholas Cruz. But they've been yeah. They've been asked for a Freedom of Information Act by the Miami Herald. 
Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Because it's going to be one of two things. Either there is a long list of his felonies, which were never referred to law enforcement, or even more hilarious, um, his file is empty. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, and today or yesterday, uh, Robert Runcie made the statement that he was not part of the Promise program, which is really the the Broward County School model um, that's being used. And uh, that he was not included in that program and that once he became 18, there was nothing they could do. (laughs) It's really, it's frightening. Well, a lot of these programs, uh, uh, all under the aegis of the school to prison pipeline, you know, as if it's not the behavior that causes the problems. No, it's just anyone writing down the criminal behavior. That's what's going to cause you these, these children, you know, problems in their future. No, it, it's the behavior that, <laughs> that, is, that makes it difficult for them to get into Ivy League schools and design spaceships. Um, but, but there are a lot of different pro- names for it. It's restorative justice. Um, it's the Promise Program. It's various things. There was a written agreement. You can find it online. It's probably linked on my, on my column or someone else printing my column. Um, and they all signed off on it. They signed a contract essentially agreeing we won't keep a record of students' criminal behavior because that could hurt them later in life if anyone knows. Now, most of the time, um, I ought to say, um, (laughs) as I do in my column, most of the time... That isn't the problem with this program. Isn't that it's going to lead to a mass shooting? It did in this case. Right. I mean, there's no dispute about it. They left a paper trail, and the only excuse, the only alternative, is for school officials and for Scott Israel to say, "Oh my gosh, we had no idea. No one ever told us." But ha ha, there's a paper trail of that too. We know they knew, and we know that they agreed in advance not to arrest. Uh, students for criminal behavior, particularly if, if, if they would involve punishing brown or black bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of the time, what it does is just, you know, lead to broken bones and teachers being thrown off, thrown off roofs and, and broken jaws. I mean, when you have, and a lot of this has happened in Minnesota, um, when you have teachers, you're already starting with Minnesota, a very left-wing state, um, teachers, a very left-wing profession, When they start complaining about the inability to suspend misbehaving students, um, by misbehaving I mean sending the teacher to the hospital, um, it's it's reached crisis proportions. So most of the time the problem is kids can't learn. You're affecting the marginal students, kids who could have stayed behind and, and, um, you know, if you threw out the the, the criminals, um, they've learned something, they behave themselves, no, they can fall into the bad crowd, no one learns anything, it's just mayhem all over. Um, this, this is one of the worst things the Obama administration did. And as I warn at the end of the column, um, <laughs> you, you absolutely know the next time the Democrats have the presidency and both houses of Congress, they are going to impose racial quotas on, on who gets sent to prison. We're going to have to start em- emptying the prisons until we have the exact same percentage of Asians and blacks and Hispanics and whites. Um, because of this insane commitment to the idea that everyone must commit crimes at the exact same rate. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, this is not news to people living here in in South Florida. And unfortunately, we've had our noses rubbed in at this time. But um, what's so incredible to me is the idea that a faked um, uh, record, a school record, because I think you said in your column, if you had, you know, group A and group B and group B never gets punished or never gets, you know, called out for bad behavior, of course, they're going to have better records. But do you really think that those kids who are beating other kids up or throwing teachers off roofs are going to do well? Uh, they're going to end up in prison regardless if they continue with those behaviors. And they're certainly not going to Ivy League schools. Yes, and probably much worse. I mean, what they learn, um, thanks to uh, the responses to this idiocy, the schools to prison pipeline, is what they learn is there are no consequences for bad behavior. Um, when, when they finally, uh, you know, emerge from school, having been uh, juvenile delinquents the whole time with zero consequence, I think they're going to be quite surprised that they can't behave that way as adults without facing, facing prison time. Um, I, I, I mean, if you talk to any, any teachers, particularly um, in, in, in disadvantaged areas, um, in urban areas, what they'll tell you is if we could just get 
10% of the students out, or whatever the percentage is. Sometimes it's, you know, 2 or 3%. If we could just get them out, everything would be fine. But no, we, we, we must remain focused on making sure the most troublesome students who are ruining it for everyone else, ruining it for 90% of the school, um, no, make sure that we don't hurt their chances by writing, keeping a record of their criminal behavior. Yeah. Well, look, we did it when it came to immigration as well with with schools. I mean, down here in South Florida, you can't teach in a Broward County public school without being ESOL certified, meaning that you have to be able to teach a classroom of children who speak any language and and other than English. It could be Mandarin. It could be Arabic. It could be uh, uh, Patois, you know, French for for the Creole students. And uh, you know what it ended up doing? It drove out the really quality teachers from from the very same schools and you ended up with kids coming fresh out of college uh, forced to become you know disciplinarians and teachers in our school and uh, abandoning the profession in short order going on to corporate life as quickly as they could we have uh, we've ruined schools I would think that would have a particularly disparate impact on the female teachers. I mean, when you have to be built like, like a Marine to teach at a public high school, mm-hmm. um, you're not going to have a lot of, you know, delicate, petite French teachers. Right. Yeah. No, listen, this has been problematic. I, you know, my daughter um, taught. I, you know, education is my background. That's what all my graduate degrees are in. And I couldn't teach after a while, particularly uh, here in Broward County, because uh, the so much was expected of a classroom teacher and so little was paid. Um, now add to that, I I happen to be the kind of teacher who would absolutely want to be armed in this setting. Um, and yet now, you know, we're wrestling over even that. Like we had a, a legislator here in Tallahassee say, well, we can't give teacher arms because then black and brown students are going to become target practice. Like I would shoot somebody because of the color of their skin. You know, Florida is a wonderful test case for a lot of things having to do with guns. When when Florida first um, enacted the concealed carry, um, in fact, this would be a fun column. Maybe I'll do it next week. Um, all of the predictions were... Um, wild, wild west. Have, they'll have fender benders and start shooting one another. And uh, Oh, I wouldn't try. I love when people say, I wouldn't trust myself with a gun. I have <laughs> such a hot temper. You know, uh, for someone who, who doesn't drive, is a very terrible driver, that would be me, um, most people get in a deadly weapon every single day of their lives. Right. If, you wanna get, if you wanted to kill someone, you can do it with your car, um, and, and everyone... Well, pretty much accepts me is a is a fabulous driver, but you get you no, no none of that happened. Florida passes concealed carry. We didn't get any shootouts in parking lots over parking spaces or after fender benders or all of the hysterical predictions. I, I mean, that's what someone was complaining on Twitter today. Um, oh, I don't see why you have to know all the gun terminology to discuss guns. No, but I'm not talking about gun terminology like like which caliber you would choose for which kind of of shooting. We're talking about basic facts like the fact that the main instructor of of gun usage in America is the NRA. Right. They don't give very much to politicians. That gun owners are extremely responsible. There are rules and jobs. Like the fact that you do have background checks. There are universal background checks unless you're selling, you know, grandma's gun to your nephew. Right. Well, but look, you know, the, this whole idea of describing this uh, weapon of war, and, and I even have a, a, a congressman who went berserk the other day and decided to call the AR-15 you know, the same as his weapon of war when he was serving in Iraq. It is not the same. It has no capacity to become an automatic weapon the way an M-16 does. And the only difference between it and any other rifle is the stock, and it's a piece of plastic that you can take on. It makes the gun look more metal. Menacing. It makes it more lightweight. But, uh, you know, this 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 insanity of me having to debate people who don't know the difference between a semi-automatic and an automatic weapon is frustrating. Yes, I think I think we have ground them down so much that may be the one fact we're finally getting through to liberals. Um, but, you know, the ironic thing about this Parkland shooting is that 
This was the left Kate Steinle. This was the case they chose. They were going to ride this to gun control. This is going to be our case in chief. Um, as I pointed out, not the Pulse Club, nightclub in, in Orlando for some reason. Yeah. Not San, San Bernardino. No, 47% of our mass shootings are committed by people who are only here because of Teddy Kennedy's 1965 Immigration Act, either first or second generation immigrants. So um, actually, that's a problem we could solve very easily. It would solve lots of other problems, too, without taking anyone's guns away. Um, but now we find out that even this one, the one they chose as their case in chief, okay, if this is the one we're going to do something about, then, then, then destroy all of these black studies departments and, and education schools who are pushing the insanity, the primitive logic of the school-to-prison pipeline. Yeah. That's what caused this mass, or allowed this mass shooting to happen. There's no way that Nick Nicholas Cruz should have been or would have been out on the street, um, much less able to amass an arsenal of guns, but for the school and law enforcement's policy to not arrest students. Yeah, I agree with you. And look, uh, Jason Riley wrote an uh, op-ed yesterday, which, uh, you know, talked about how it's it's 50 years since the Kerner report, which was based on the, uh, of course, uh, the Detroit riots and and all of the subsequent. uh, And that study, which was the first term paper I ever wrote, um, literally said that uh, the problem in America is racism still. And people are still saying the same thing 50 years later when I have absolutely, you know, concrete evidence that racism is not the problem today that it was 50 years ago. And it wasn't the problem 50 years ago that it was 70 years ago. Um, But this failure to accept success is really frustrating. Yes, success on that front, though, it always I always wonder if. Um, right when, you know, the 1964 Civil Rights Act is passed, you have African Americans who have been through slavery, been through Jim Crow. They're starting very low on the economic ladder, um, actually very high marriage rates back then um, in any event. If instead of dumping millions of third world immigrants on the country that we had to deal with, if instead of that, if, we had, if the country had just focused on, okay, Okay, we gave, the, we gave African Americans the short end of the stick for a few hundred years. We're spending it all on them. We're going to concentrate on how to move African Americans into the middle class, um, married, um, um, educated, <laughs> educated, or not educated, but succeeding. Mm-hmm. Um, how much different things would look today? But no, no, let's, let's just. The Democrats just wanted the votes, and they don't care what happens to their voters. You know, Al Sharpton or somebody has this line, oh, conservatives, they only care about the fetus until it's born. Um, well, as absurd as that is, um, well, yeah, okay, I say liberals only com- care about immigrants until they can vote. Yeah. That's, that's the end of it. Yeah, and even now, they don't care that much with the, the offer that they had from the president who was delusional at the time. Hey, Anne, thank you. I appreciate it. We've linked the article up there. It's Racial Quotas Kill Kids, and it deals directly with what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks here. Thanks, Anne. Have a great day. Good to talk to you, Joyce. Always a pleasure. Stop hanging around with Allison Camerata. We'll be right back.